Yeah, welcome everyone. Um, our first speaker is Andrew McCallum, so I don't think I have to do a large, great introduction because everyone should know him already. He's one of the people who has really worked for a long time on the intersection between machine learning and knowledge representation. And he does much work on information extraction in particular. If you have been there on the po at the poster session on Monday, you have seen very many posters with his name. And I think today the talk will give a nice overview of the very of the topics um, covered at like research at UMass, where he's a professor. So yeah, thank you for coming. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you, Veronica, for the. Um, invitation. I'm very happy to be here. I enjoyed this workshop so much last year, and uh, I'm glad to see it continuing. Um, another event that's continuing that I want to mention as I get started is uh, about 10 years ago, I started a workshop in automated knowledge-based construction that happened in Grenoble, and it continued as a workshop nearly every year after that. And uh, just last year, we turned it into a conference, a freestanding conference for the first time. Um, and uh, you know, folks like um, you know, Sebastian Riedel and Fernando Pereira and uh, uh, many others were there. It was a great success and it will be happening again uh, this coming June um, in Irvine, California. There'll be a paper deadline, um, let's see here, most likely in early February. So we'll you know, look for those announcements coming out soon. All right, so I'm happy today to talk about deep learning for knowledge, representation, and reasoning. So sometimes a machine is asked to make a decision from some perceptual information, like an image in which it's asked to say whether this patch contains a certain kind of cancer. But other times a machine is asked to do something that feels less like type one kind of reasoning, what I described above, more like type two, something that might require um, a few steps of reasoning. Now, of course, we can take a task like this and kind of turn it into type one style processing by um, maybe just trying to find documents that are the nearest neighbors to that uh, query. And that's essentially information retrieval. And that goes one step towards helping people answer this question. Um, but it would be like to get, nice to get a more detailed answer. There's been quite a bit of interest, of course, lately in question answering from text that would pick, you know, pick a document, pick a segment of, uh, um, from that document, and do some additional work on it to try to pull out a single um, entity. Um, but sometimes the kinds of, in order to answer a question, we really need to integrate information across multiple documents or across many different sources of information. And that's harder to do without some notion of what an entity is, what entity resolution are, and then some notion of what those relationships uh, look like. And so this is one reason that a lot of people are interested in, um, uh, um, in knowledge bases, graphs with nodes for entities and edges for uh, relations. And so given a question like this, we can find um, like where heart, heart disease is represented uh, um, here. And although there may not be answers that are just one hop away from that, we can do some reasoning through some multiple hops in order to find um, some answers to our question. And also see the textual evidence that caused those edges to exist. Um, so because of the great capabilities of these, there's been a lot of interest from you know, many commercial entities, uh, including IBM as well, of course, uh, in building such large knowledge bases. Um, so now I want to talk a bit about where the purple items in this uh, um, picture come from, what I think of as the schema of entity types and relations. So here, for example, in this entity, it's called a disease. And that might be an, a fine-grained enough notion of what this entity is in order to answer some questions. But in other contexts, we might wish that we had a more fine-grained notion of what this is, like a genetic, a disease that's a genetic disorder. Um, here's another entity um, that has a particular type. But maybe uh, you know, in other contexts, we would wish that we had a more coarse-grained notion of what this is in order to help us um, reason with more generality. And the same things apply to relations um, as well. And so one of our major goals is to build a knowledge base that, in a sense, we think of as having an open schema that lets us ask about things at various levels of granularity or ask about things according to many different schema types that arise naturally in the world. And yet, um, sort of with the same level of openness that we're used to having when we do keyword search for documents, where we can just type in anything, ask about anything, um, but at the same time, preserve entity relation structure and, um, and provide the ability to do some reasoning. So that's a lot of what I want to talk about today. Um, and as a first step, I want to introduce you to the work that we've been doing over the last roughly decade in a system that we call universal schema. Um, okay, so our goal is to build a knowledge base. And uh, we'll have many sources of evidence, but um, among them will be some text. 
And what does it look like to build a knowledge base from text? Well, we've got to find the entity mentions. I want to do entity resolution to find the multiple places where Bill Gates is mentioned. Um, and um, I can do this for you know, many, many different entities uh, that appear in the text and elsewhere. And I, as the designer, may have a notion of what's, what knowledge base schema I have in mind, and so I've defined that, and the, these form some columns uh, in this small matrix that I'm building up here, and I may even have some prior knowledge that lets me fill in, at least for some, some of these entries, like, you know, which, people, you know, which entries are people, uh, or you know, what, you know, what are their, uh, their various different types. Um, but it may not be complete, like, I mean, I don't, here I don't know what Seattle is yet. Um, I might try to augment my information by importing some pr previously structured knowledge into my knowledge base. So um, you know, some, knowledge, some other knowledge base built by somebody else that has information that's relevant to me. Now, the person who built that knowledge base probably didn't have exactly my schema in mind. Um, and uh, it comes in some different schema. And I could try to align their schema to mine exactly and just sort of declare my schema is gonna store the truth and that'll be the end of it. Um, but there are many concepts that uh, you know, sort of overlap partially, and making that alignment can be surprisingly difficult. And so the approach that we've been advocating in Universal Schema is that we're gonna keep around all, um, all of the input schema all at once, um, not try to pack all of our semantics into uh, you know, one set of boxes to fit them all, um, and then nonetheless learn mutual implica implicature amongst all of these. So we're gonna embrace the diversity and the ambiguity of these um, many different schema. And, and another schema actually is, uh, is the symbols that come from raw text, just the te you know, like textual expressions for things are yet another schema. It's, it's the natural language schema and it's very big. And so these matrices can have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of columns uh, of ways to express entity types and relation types. Um, and I may observe some things directly, in which case I, I have some things colored in here already. Uh, um, here, let's focus on relation types. Um, so if I want to make a prediction of, well, is Obama, um, or like here, well, was Obama, sorry, this slide's a little bit out of date, uh, president of the United States, well, that was directly observed, and so I can answer that. But I'd like to be able to answer for all the other cells as well, whether they're true or not. And so I want to, I want to essentially do matrix completion here or uh, get this to generalize, and they're gonna do that by giving myself vectors for each of the rows and columns. A vector to represent each, each relation type and a vector to represent each entity pair. And I train this by picking one of the positive observed cells and look at the dot product of the vectors uh, that correspond to that intersection, picking another empty cell in the same row that I'll assume for the moment is negative, um, and that there's another dot product from its corresponding vectors. And my objective uh, function for training is that the first dot product should be larger than the second. So in essence, I can, you know, this training instance will take these three vectors and the objective will say, well, you know, since Bill and Steve are friends, I want these to be close to each other so they have a high dot product. Uh, um, and since Bill is not the president of Steve, um, I want to push those further away. And training then arranges um, uh, you know, all of these vectors in a space that causes them to answer these kinds of questions correctly. You know, learning things uh, um, like, uh, you know, CEO and being an organization member are related to each other, head of state and president are related to each other, um, et cetera. So here's some examples that come from some, uh, some real data. Uh, here we observed that Volvo bought a stake in, um, in, the, in, in Scania, which is another car company. Um, and then we infer that Volvo owns a percentage of Scania. Oops, sorry, I went a little fast there. Um, here's another example that I like because it shows the model's ability to capture asymmetry. Um, we observe that Kevin Boyle is a historian at Ohio State and then predict he's a professor at Ohio State. But when we observe that Friedman is a professor at Harvard, we don't infer necessarily that he's a historian. Um, all right, so this is my brief introduction to universal schema. Um, so what do we end up with here? It's a knowledge base, but where instead of having just symbols on the nodes and edges of our knowledge graph, we have vectors. Um, to help us generalize. And I find that just particularly fascinating. It's um, like the combination of a structured view of the world and sort of an embedded, a smooth embedding view of the world. Um, and so now I'd like to talk briefly about how we do reasoning uh, um, here. And this may be a review for some of you have heard me talk before, but I'm gonna be talking about some newer work when I get into box embeddings in a bit. So let's say that somebody asks you about the nature of the relationship between Melinda and Seattle. Well, you didn't observe any direct edge between them. They never co-occurred in a sentence or in any other knowledge base. So 
first time I think, well, I have, I have no evidence, there's no answer that I can give for what I think that relationship might be. But there is, there's other information around those two entities in the graph. And um, perhaps I could notice that Melinda and Seattle are indirectly connected by a path that says, well, Melinda uh, um, has Bill as a spouse. Uh, um, Bill is the chairman of Microsoft, which is headquartered in Seattle. And using that chain of reasoning, I might be able to infer that, you know, with some probability that I think their relationship is lives in. And in an old style symbolic way of reasoning, I would write that knowledge down with a rule like this. Right? If A is the spouse of B, and B is the chairman of C, and C is headquartered in D, then I infer with some probability that A lives in D. And that's all well and good, but what if instead of chairman, I have CEO, I need another rule for that, or CEO, there's another rule, or what if instead of talking about the spouse a hop in my chain, I'm talking about a child of instead, well now I need a combinatorial combination, a number of different rules, and it's, it's looking painful. So we have been working, um, like leveraging the fact that we have embeddings on the edges of this knowledge base um, to try to do reasoning, not on symbols, but reasoning on vectors instead. Uh, um, and you know, after, of course, many decades of research and work on what it means to do logical reasoning on symbols, I find it especially fascinating to consider, well, what, what does it look like to do logical reasoning on vectors? So we've been using a recurrent neural network that consumes an arbitrary length path at each step, consuming the vector of the new edge that's being consumed and outputting a vector that represents its Sort of the, sem the semantic composition of what it believes is the nature of the relationship between the endpoints so far. And by the time it's completed this entire, this path here, shown here, it produces, a, you know, our, our model indeed produces a vector that's very close to the lives in relation. So the parameters of this recurrent neural network have basically learned, I mean, embedded in there are rules of logic about how to compose the meaning of uh, um, the semantics of these steps of this chain of inference. Um, and we've been doing this work since 2015 uh, with a number of improvements. Um, when run on a moderate amount of data like this, um, uh, like here are some example predictive paths that pop out. Um, here I'm trying to predict, given a book, what's the original language in which it was written for a case in which there's that direct edge does not exist in the knowledge base. Um, the, the, the path found by our system goes from the book to another book, the previous one in the series of books. Um, who was the author of that book? What's another person who shares, sorry, what's that person's nationality? What's another person who shares that nationality and what language do they speak? So that seems like kind of a reasonable chain of inference to um, try to make an estimate of uh, what, what a, a book's language is. Um, and there are a number of other examples I'm not gonna take the time to show. Um, and over time, through various different research improvements, um, accuracy on this task has been, um, uh, has been growing. Um, and actually there's, um, there's some work that we just put on archive yesterday that also has to do with uh, chains of reasoning. Um, but it's, in a way it's like a mixture between chains of reasoning here and textual question answering in that the chains of evidence it consumes at each step are not just individual links in a knowledge base but actually like whole passages of the kind that would be consumed by a textual based question answering system. Um, the, uh, um, so in a way, it's like a looser way of doing these chains of reasoning, and I'm quite excited about that work also. This is work by one of my students, Rajarshi Das. Um, all right, so in a really big knowledge base, you also need to think carefully about how you find the path that you think leads to the right answer. And um, you know, this is a, a path that makes sense, but there are many other paths, and some of them just you know, don't really carry many semantics, uh, you know, much semantics at all. Um, and the, um, in a big graph, there are many, many paths to explore, and so we'd like to be more clever about how we explore um, uh, uh, the different candidate chains. So this is essentially like searching for a proof for the answer uh, um, uh, to the question that we're trying to address. And we've been doing work in reinforcement learning to do that search intelligently. So um, uh, here the setting is that you're given an entity and a relation, and, the, and to answer the question, you're asked to, to uh, fill in um, the, the, the second entity to complete the triple. And so we start at the source entity. There are a number of different outgoing relations that we could choose among. The reinforcement learning agent just chooses one of them as an action and then continues making choices until it thinks that it's arrived at an answer. And um, if it outputs the answer that's correct, then the reinforcement learning agent gets a reward of one. 
Hello, Celine. Welcome. I'm so happy to see you here. Uh, if, <laughs> thank you. Well, I'm relying on your pointed questions as usual. I'm sure you'll keep me on my toes. Um, and if it arrives at the wrong answer, then it gets uh, 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 a reward of zero. Um, and uh, you know, we train this on situations in which we know the true triples. Um, and indeed, we're able to get this to successfully learn. Because we're trying to learn by gradient descent, which you know, requires a smooth space, but the actions are discrete, we need, of course, the, the reinforce trick, which is a way of using sampling to get, um, uh, to get gradients from discrete choices like this. But it does indeed converge, and there are some special tricks we can use to get it to converge even better. And, uh, um, and here's an example of, a, of an inferred path that, uh, that's learned by this reinforcement learning agent. Um, Let's see here, I guess we could look at the top one. So given the film Step Up Revolution, we're trying to determine its country of origin. And there was no direct connection to the knowledge base, but it finds that if it goes to the production company and then asks where it's located, then that's a chain that may provide some good evidence. All right. So, um, so we've been talking about uh, um, reasoning about entities and their relations from textual evidence. And I want to try to paint a larger picture here. Sorry, this is a bit abstract, so let me give you a guided tour here. So um, the orange circles at the bottom uh, are meant to represent mentions in text of entities. And the crayon edge here is really some text that we believe is expressing some relationship between them. And the blue dots are representing um, resolved entities. And so the scenario I've described so far, I think, looks at some particular textual evidence, resolves them to their entities, and then based on the textual evidence, decides that, well, we think that there's some relation there. Um, and so this is, the, this is the worldview that I've been talking about so far. But actually, I think that we should actually be thinking with a worldview a bit more like this. And what do I mean here? So the light blue circles down here, I think of as sub-entities. Um, it, as an aside here, it happens to be, I mean, I haven't talked much about entity resolution here, but we've been doing a lot of work there as well. And the style of entity resolution we do is one that's hierarchical. So it builds trees along the way. So you know, there may be uh, um, you know, 50,000 mentions of Barack Obama, and there's some node in that tree that represents Barack Obama, the entity. But there are many other you know, like substructure. There's a lot of substructure in the tree between the mentions of the leaves and the Obama node there. And I think about those nodes as yeah, what we call sub-entities. And maybe a lot of us don't know a lot about biomedicine, including me. But for Obama, we could imagine that there would be some interior node there that would represent Barack Obama as teenager in Hawaii, Obama as senator, as you know, candidate for president, president, and post-president. And that certain relationships would be true of those sub-entities that are not true of other sub-entities. So it's not always best to represent an entity, say, up at the, at the, at the the high level entity level, we might sometimes like to express relationships at the sub-entity level. Similarly, there's further abstract structure above the entities. And I think of these things as types, uh, um, like you know, Barack Obama um, is a person and a man and a politician and a book author. Um, and, and so those are additional, additional relationships. And we can um, also, I mean, digital types. And we can also put relationships there. And I think of that as representing common sense. Um, which is really quite nice. Um, so to answer a question, we may like to operate at different levels of abstraction here and actually make chains of reasoning in a graph that looks like this, which sometimes will operate by traversing edges up at this abstract level because we can answer a question perfectly fine there. But in other cases, we really need the context and the specificity, maybe even to traverse edges all the way down to some particular piece of text capturing some particular context along the way uh, on our chain of reasoning. All right, so we've been thinking then <coughs> quite a bit about these very deep abstraction hierarchies. And um, that's uh, um, you know, reflected in the fact that these entity types that we have here, which we've previously been treating as or like a, you know, sitting in some flat space, actually would be better represented if we put them into a hierarchy. And so a couple years ago, we were looking at if we have a hierarchy like this, can we leverage this to do an even better job to learn better vectors that give more accurate answers? Um, and the answer to this is yes. For this, we need some mathematical operation between vectors that's not symmetric, right? Because I'm trying to capture a, a directed arrow here, an asymmetric relationship between, say, person and athlete. You know, uh, you know, all athletes may be persons, but not the other way around. So I can't use dot product, which is symmetric. But I can use a bilinear model, which is uh, non-symmetric. 
Uh, that's one choice. Another choice is to use um, complex vectors, vectors that have complex numbers in all of their elements. And that also, just by the way the mathematics works out there, happens to be non-symmetric. Um, and so when we do this, um, we can also then take textual dimensions and learn to map these into vector space and then be able to predict their types as well. Um, so when we train in a way that trains with an objective on the matrix that I described earlier, the objective I described earlier, but they'll also add to our objective the, a notion that you should obey the tree edges um, that we have as prior knowledge, then um, uh, indeed we do um, a better job. So, I know which I'm about to describe in a moment. So, let's see. Uh, many of the existing type hierarchies that we were out there in previous data, notably the, the most prevalent among, I think, the FIGAR data set of fine-grained types, wasn't nearly big enough for us. We were interested in having something much bigger, so we created a new data set we called TypeNet from the union of WordNet and Freebase and uh, you know, some automated editing uh, um, uh, um, as well as kind of picking the types that really made the most sense and chopping off the upper parts of the word of the um, uh, the word net hierarchy that seemed just a bit too abstract and end up with hierarchies to give you a sense. Here's some samplings of some parts of the hierarchy uh, for parents of an Olympic host city or parents of cheese uh, or parents of a drafted athlete. Um, and so you can see it's not a tree, it's a dag, which is, not, which is interesting. Um, yeah, and it can be quite deep. So, and what we found is that uh, in comparison with our original methods that did not use the hierarchy at all, represented by these upper numbers, 68 and 69. Um, using the tree in various combined ways yield here you know, more than 10% uh, um, increase in accuracy, which we are very happy to see. Um, all right, so now for the main body of new work that I have in mind, um, I wanna talk about the following. So here's this rich hierarchy, and we've already noted that it's not just tree-shaped, it's dag-shaped. And although I've drawn hard edges here, I actually really want to claim that I would, I'm pining for something a little bit softer or something that would be able to, to represent probabilities. You know, things like um, many politicians are book authors, but not all of them. Um, and so it, it would seem uh, unsafe to put, put an edge between, uh, you know, from politician up to book author. But I'd rather not just drop that, that, that known correlation on the floor and not represent it at all. So what kinds of representations can I use to represent DAGs and also probabilities and also sort of gain some of the softness that I get from, uh, um, from representing things in terms of uh, in some embedded fashion. And this leads me to uh, work that I'm extremely excited about that we've been doing over the last three years or so on box embeddings. And this is work um, by my students uh, Lorraine Lee and Luke Vilnes, Dong Zhu Zhang, um, and also um, uh, one of my new postdocs, Michael Bracco, who's actually with us here in the audience. Um, and we've also been doing some collaboration with IBM um, on this topic as well. All right, so in uh, most of the work on deep learning for uh, NLP and build deep learning generally, how do we represent uh, um, concepts? We re represent them with vectors, which we can think of as points in, in dimensional space. And uh, it's, it's, you know, vectors do a nice job in a lot of ways. Actually, let me go back. So, you know, they can be arranged so that neighborhood relations amongst the vectors make sense. The animals tend to be clustered together here differently from the furniture. Um, uh, and, um, but there are some regrets here, right? So here I have rabbit and mammal. The vectors here are not representing the notion that, well, the mammal is a more general concept than the rabbit. Um, and it would be nice to capture that in a, um, in a very clear way. And so um, with that in mind, uh, so you know, they don't really capture like a, a region uh, with a, like the, the notion that some concepts have a broad region and other ones are more narrow. Um, also the typical you know, um, operation done between them is a dot product, which is not asymmetric. So with that in mind, um, in 2014, uh, my student Luke Vildenis and I um, had an iClear paper on um, associating each concept not with the point, but with the Gaussian uh, um, in space. Perfect, thank you. Um, so general concepts can have a broad variance, and um, more specific concepts can have a more narrow variance. We can, we therefore have like a region for each one of these. There are asymmetric, um, uh, you know, the distance measures between these Gaussian distributions. Basically, we used like a KL divergence, which is asymmetric. 
Um, uh, we can represent concepts that are disjoint from each other. Um, but Gaussians have had a number of problems that I don't have time to get into all of them, but among them is that they're not closed under intersection. Uh, so the intersection of two Gaussians is uh, it's not Gaussian shaped uh, um, here. And so um, that made us interested in some alternatives. And one that's been explored by others are so-called cone representations. Um, and so here we associate with each concept a single point, but actually that point is going to represent a region that spreads away from the origin in all of the dimensions. So it sort of represents a cone that spreads away from the origin. And so and concepts with embeddings closer to the origin cover a broader region, and the further you get from the origin, it makes a smaller cone that um, represents more specific concepts. And so you can represent a region, you can have asymmetric distance uh, calculations. It's closed under intersection because, say, you know, the, everything that's both an herbivore and a mammal would be captured by a dot at this intersection exactly, right? But it's not... Um, it's not disjoint, right? I can't capture things that are disjoint because far enough out there, everything overlaps eventually. Um, so there's a probabilistic version of this. Uh, um, and um, uh, so here I have a rabbit and a deer. Um, but this intersection here represents the region of being both a rabbit and a deer at the same time, which seems, well, that just seems wrong, right? Uh, um, and furthermore, it gets even more ridiculous because if I say, ask, well, what's the probability of being a rabbit conditioned on being a deer? Well, what does that look like in Venn diagram fashion? That's like, well, you take the volume of deer, sorry, you take the volume of the intersection and divide it by the volume of deer. And actually, the volume of the intersection is a pretty large proportion in comparison to that. So it's like, like you know, what does that look like? Almost like a third or more than a third. So again, this just seems wrong, uh, the fact that we can't represent disjoint things. So with that in mind, we have been working on associating each concept with an n-dimensional box in space. They capture a region. One box can contain another box. There are asymmetric distance uh, measures between them. They can represent disjointness. And also, boxes are closed under intersection. The intersection of two boxes is another box. Um, furthermore, we can train these boxes so that uh, they all exist in, they, they sit within the unit box, which will represent the universe and have probability one. And the volume of the boxes inside, we can train so that their, their volume is equal to the marginal probability of that concept. And we can train them so that the volume of the box intersections are proportional to their conditional, their joint probabilities or their conditionals when normalized by, uh, by one of them. So um, the fact that these represent very crisp probabilistic models has us especially excited. And let me, uh, let me step back to so maybe explain what, how and why. What do I think of as like the two biggest advances in all of machine learning in the last in all three decades? I think it's been compact representations of joint probability distributions, like think graphical models on the one hand, and secondly, representation learning, right? think deep learning. And this feels like it's a step that sits at the intersection of both of those, right? We're learning representations, uh, so sort of, uh, very much like deep learning, um, but we have a very crisp, formal, uh, um, compact representation of probability distributions at the same time. Um, all right, so let me give you some intuition for what this looks like. Uh, like how does training look like? Um, We'll, say, we'll have a bunch of concepts. We'll initialize their box positions randomly. And uh, the training data will, will consist of you know, giving it some marginal probabilities and some joint probabilities or maybe some conditional probabilities. And then in order, then the model will you know, do gradient descent, gradually moving the boxes around in order to satisfy those training objectives and then settle some place when it's done. Um, what is this little demonstration data? It's actually movie data from movie lens where each box corresponds to a movie and its, its volume is like the, the marginal probability that people like that movie and intersections correspond to the joint probability that uh, the same person would like both movies. So overlap between boxes indicate that the same kind of people would like both of these movies. So the purple uh, rectangle in the background is Forrest Gump. Uh, lots of people like Forrest Gump. Um, the two reddish ones are Lord of the Rings, which have high overlap, uh, well, you know, two and three, which have high overlap with each other. Um, there's some Disney movies off in the blue off to the left that also have high overlap with each other, and the narrow bands at the bottom are some Hitchcock movies. So this, this makes sense. And when we compare the accuracy of 
learning models about uh, this market basket problem or these, these overlaps um, uh, using various alternatives to boxes, we find that uh, boxes are providing some accuracy advantages. So what would, might be considered a nice, you know, a default, like some bilinear model, is getting, what, 83 here, and here we're getting, uh, you know, 89 um, with this box model. Okay, so boxes are not perfect, though. Uh, um, and um, they do have some limitations. And one of them is that if you have just one box per concept, there are some valid probability distributions that those boxes cannot represent. And one of them is one in which we say that say, each concept has equal marginal probability. Each of the pairs has some non-zero joint probability, but the triple altogether has zero probability. And that's, that it is possible to have such a distribution, but these boxes with their convex shapes just can't represent that. So one way to represent that instead is to have a mixture of, of box models. And essentially, it's like we've taken our universe and divided it into two sub-universes where each concept now has a box on each side. Um, and, uh, and this, given the constraints, um, uh, uh, um, you can learn the constraints well. You can see on the left-hand side, the green box is kind of like shrinking all the way to zero, and like the, 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 the weighted sum of those, uh, of those two combinations does, um, does yield um, exactly the desired um, attribute. Um, okay, so like there are various different, now let me talk about some different ways we could think about the dimensions of these boxes. So far we've talked about the dimensions as all corresponding to a single box in n-dimensional space. So here are four dimensions that I've just drawn here separately, and this would, rep this would then correspond to some four-dimensional box. So here's a tesseract that's just representing that. Um, but of course we could also, maybe we could consider dividing the dimensions such that um, two of the dimensions correspond to one box and then two of the dimensions correspond to some other box in a different space. And note that because two boxes in order to overlap have to overlap in all of their dimensions, you can think about the dimensions within one box and the way we calculate overlaps is being like calculating a conjunction, right? If, you, if you're non-overlapping in just any one of those dimensions, then you don't overlap at all, right? But given that we do it, like a sum or a weighted average amongst these two different box models, these act more like a disjunction. And so by setting up boxes like this, we're able to really, in a very native way, represent disjunction of conjunctions, which I think of as, you know, logically speaking, a very powerful uh, um, way to be working. Um, we can also, of course, have, uh, you know, just represent a whole collection of one-dimensional boxes, uh, um, and we've been doing some work there as well. And um, so now I want to describe some ways that, we're, uh, um, that we've been um, you know, trying to apply boxes. And another one is to do uh, common sense. So I understand IBM is participating in the DARPA machine common sense program, and we're very happy to be in that program also. So we've been thinking quite a bit about common sense. And a general kind of common sense we're interested in is being able to, say, take some arbitrary phrase, including phrases that we've never seen before, we put them into an LSTM, which is trained to output the parameters of a box. And then given two different phrases, we can get two different boxes and look at their overlap in order to be able to calculate, well, given that you observe a gray-haired man wearing a tie, what's the probability that you're observing a man in a suit? Uh, and that we would calculate by the, that by the overlap of these boxes. So we took a large number of images from Flickr, threw away the images, but just looked at the captions that have uh, many, you know, many different captions that correspond to the same underlying world truth, took each of these captions and parsed them, divided them up into pieces so that we could count various both fine-grained and general and you know, fine-grained and more broad um, uh, pieces so that we can basically count like how many images that had two dogs also, uh, um, you know, also had grass uh, in them. And by counting this, we can get you know, uh, joint probabilities and marginal probabilities, and then train this LSTM to predict that. And so, we could, so here's some example outputs from this model. Um, uh, let's see here. Um, uh, no, given that you observe holding an instrument, what's the probability that you're in the basement? Well, that's pretty low, not impossible, but it would be unusual for somebody to have an instrument in the basement. Um, if you're watching a performance, what's the probability that you've got a group of people? That's pretty high. If you've got an adult in a dance floor, what's the probability that he or she is wearing clothing? Well, that's uh, um, pretty high, but uh, not, uh, not one. Um, and then here, here's one that's just absolutely entailed, and that makes sense as well. Um, and what we find again is that uh, in comparison with some alternatives of the box metal uh, methods do well. Okay, I have five minutes left. I think I should be able to finish this up. So as a next step, and uh, um, we've been very excited to begin to think about what would it mean to do 
I mean, what I've described so far is a bit like shallow neural networks, right? It just like corresponds to just word vectors or word embeddings. But what we'd really like to be doing is to be, to be doing deep learning uh, um, uh, instead. And in a way, this is motivated by the example I gave before. We, we were given a sentence. This was represented in terms of vectors as it went into the LSTM, which is all, you know, can, you know LSTMs work on vectors, right, not on boxes. And we just output a box at the end. But of course, you know, it would be nice to capture this notion that, well, a man is a concept at a certain level of granularity and that there are other concepts and we know how they relate to each other using the really nice box semantics that we have, and then to have some sort of model that can operate on boxes in order to output a box. And that seems like it would give us some better capabilities. We could start with boxes here, I suppose, and then try to turn these boxes into some sort of, like, almost like, sufficient statistics of, or some statistics of boxes that could be vectorized and stuck into the LSTM, but there are just so many different possible statistics there that would try but probably fail to capture the geometric properties of these boxes that I'm not optimistic about that working. So what we'd really like is some mechanism for doing box-to-box -box transformations here. And so for that, we probably want something that corresponds to multiplication and addition, just like we have uh, um, for vectors. And um, so what we're looking for is what sort of operations would form a commutative monoid on boxes that would be closed under intersection, uh, um, be associative, have an identity element, things like that. So for multiplication, it seems like intersection is a reasonable choice. Uh, um, and, uh, and there certainly is the identity um, uh, um, um, element here, right? Just uh, it's like the full box here gives you back uh, the input. There's some question about what to do when two concepts are disjoint. Like, what is their intersection? Well, one thing you can do is calculate in a way like the negative intersection. <laughs> like the space between them is a, like a negative box in space, and that negative box has a center. And you could just say that well, the, the intersection of these two things will be a zero width box at the center of that negative box. Um, and that's actually, I mean, there are other alternatives, but that's what we've been thinking about lately. So we also need a way to do addition. So we've been thinking about this as almost like a, like these represent two different distributions. What does it mean to add two different distributions? So it's like a weighted sum of those distributions. So in a way that looks like this, but we want to represent it with a single box in the output. So we'll find like the single box that best approximates the weighted average of the two input distributions. Um, and, uh, and like you know, one way that we could think about getting that, uh, um, you know, that single box that does this approximation is by taking an average of side lengths and centers. That's okay, but it seems a little bit odd that this very small box has just a big, big, big an influence on the center of the output box than this large box does. So maybe we should do a weighted average instead. Uh, um, say a weighted average of the centers uh, um, in order to get something like this. Um, and, uh, and we have to think, let's see, and then let's see, do I, what did I want to say here? And I guess then the identity method here is just the zero width box will get you back um, the, uh, the other input. Okay, so it's just some things that we can do here. So our, our parameters will then look a lot like the parameters of a neural network. They sit in like a matrix, but instead of a matrix of numbers, it's like a matrix of boxes. And so um, it's nice just to think about what do these operations look like. So one is, can we, just like you can do in matrix algebra, have you know, some setting of the parameters that just uh, produce the, uh, a match of the, out, you know, take the input and make the output identical to the input. And so sort of just like with uh, um, matrices, we, uh, regular matrices, we can um, you know, uh, define box parameters like this, which will exactly yield our inputs. That seems like a nice property. Uh, we um, can pull out a single box with something like this that pulls out this box to match here. Um, we can have a one-hot embedding that uh, um, says, well, just pull me out one stripe of my parameter matrix by turning on this box and zeroing out all the rest. That works in the way we would expect. Um, it might be a nice, another nice property to have, ooh, I really have to wrap up, is uh, this notion that you also have in deep neural networks in which um, you know, one stripe of the parameter ma matrix kind of corresponds to a prototype in input space. And if the input is near that prototype, then the hidden unit corresponding to that stripe will light up strongly. And um, so that's a property that we would like. So here's an input. Here's some parameter layers that actually match this exactly. So in a way, th this layer is a prototype that matches this exactly. 
So um, what would that look like? So I guess first we would do the intersections here um, uh, um, and get this, and then we would you know, do the weighted sum together here, which yields this, but this is not maximally active, right? It's not filling the space, so that's a little bit broken. So one thing that we could do is say, well, you know, you matched exactly the layer parameters here, and so let's just, like, it's almost as if the layer parameter here, let's treat those as if they were the full universe in each one of their spaces. So we scale up each one of these things according to the layer parameters here. But um, this has some problems, which I think I've run out of time to explain, with apologies. But there's a very nice alternative that Michael came up with, in which we, we, we sum together the layer parameters, use this shape to scale up the result of the dot product. And this gives exactly maximal activation for a match of the prototype and also matches other nice properties that we want for the rest of the model to work. And I'm sorry that I've lost, ran out of time to explain this. So, um, so these, these deep models for boxes we hope will allow models to make use of relations that are difficult to model with vectors alone. They will, um, they'll be helpful in modeling multi-relational knowledge bases. We're hoping that they, in addition to providing some probabilistic semantics deep in the middle of the network, that they may then also be more interpretable. Although we, we have, you know, we have yet to see that. It's just one of our hopes. Um, and um, and with that, I think I'll close without time to talk about my last musings. And I'll take questions. Thank you so much. Questions? Yes. Yeah, I think so. Negations are tremendously, I think, difficult both in symbolic, uh, you know, to do you know reasoning with in, in symbolic uh, 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 logic, um, as well as in other places. And I can't claim that we're poised to do much better here. You can really, you can clearly say what region of space corresponds to a negation, right? Uh, um, it's um, it's just that the shape of that negation is not a box itself, right? Uh, um, so that said, you can condition on negations and still often efficiently calculate the volume to get a, a, an answer to, to a probability. And, um, um, and what that means is that you're going to calculate the volume of something that's not exactly box-shaped, but it's still so simple that it's pretty easy to calculate the volume uh, um, of it. So I think you know, that's a partial help, but there's more to be done. Thank you for the question. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Bob. I would really like to offer you to make a full call about some crossing where there may be. Just can you explain that across languages you don't really have one to one matching to the I think so too. That's a wonderful insight. Um, I've also talked with some people in machine translation who have said that one of the common errors um, made in translation is that the word produced in the new language is related to the input word, but somehow was at the wrong level of granularity, right? Like the input uh, um, said athlete, and, and, the, and, and, and the output uh, um, you know, uh, said runner or something like that, right? And it was just too specific. And so because the vectors weren't directly capturing a notion of granularity, it had a miss here. And maybe something like this could be helpful. Yeah, thank you. I'm so glad that you asked. This is a common, uh, um, a common kind of question. So, well, it's certainly the case that you can represent the boxes in terms of some vectors, and in fact, we do internally represent them as you know the position of the center of the box and each of the side lengths, uh, right? But what I mean, the magic of what goes on here is that kind of geometric reasoning that's done in each one of the processing steps, which is not equivalent to just doing, say, dot products or other typical vector operations. Um, and so that's where I claim the improvement is. Yeah. Yeah, thank you.
this is another great question. Thank you so much for asking. There has been far too little work on how in knowledge bases to represent things, you know, facts that may change over time. Um, Gerhard Weichem has done a little. Um, I'm very happy to have a new PhD student who just finished his master's with Partha Talakdar at IT Bombay, who's done a bit of work on this. And we're, with him, actually, we're looking at um, uh, trying to make some next steps. Let me just say, before I run out of time, one brief an approach that we're now working on that I'm quite excited about that builds on boxes is to take one dimension of the box and say that's a time dimension. And then boxes can represent extents in time, and they can represent an extent during which something was true, and then the areas in, the areas in time in which it was not true. Um, now, that doesn't directly, I think, answer your question about how do we say that there's something I'm not, I think that there's a lot more that I could say but, uh, about, your, about your question. And, and with apologies, I don't think I've fully answered your question, but I think I've run out of time. Well, let's thank Andrew again. Uh, thank, you. thank you for your questions.